So I've heard that sales of this game were poor back when it was new and still had its original name, likely because it was attributed to Halloween. And horror-themed games do have a notorious history of poor sales regardless of their quality. But I have another theory. This game is broken. Eh, boy. How, how, how did this game get so highly rated for its time? Why was this game as popular as it was when it's chock full of game-breaking issues and poor design? Today's Ancient DOS game is Alien Cartage, originally known as Halloween Harry. And I apologize in advance to the large number of people who may like this thing, but this game is just not good. And after we go over the massive number of issues it has, you might agree with me. And yes, I'm playing the latest version that was released as far as I understand. Not to mention DOSBox has long since been internally patched to fix a number of other issues this game originally had when being run through emulation. And not everything I'm going to bring up is an emulation issue for sure. In fact, most of it simply comes down to poor design choices or very unusual hiccups, which I'm surprised weren't addressed. Granted, before we get on to the issues this game has, there are a couple positives. The music is fairly well done, save for the boss music, and the graphics are very bright, vibrant, and interesting. For the most part. The game clearly had some effort put into it, but it needed a lot more QA time to be tolerable to sit down and play for more than a level or two. Presuming the game even lets you beat the level you're playing. Alien Carnage was first released as Halloween Harry back in 1993, developed by Interactive Binary Solutions and Sub-Zero Software, and published through Apogee. From what I can tell, and from the look of the logos, I think IBI and Sub-Zero were closely related, though I could be wrong about that. The game's a one-player run-and-gun platformer, featuring VGA 320x200 256 color graphics and support for PC speaker and Sound Blaster sound. All the music in the game sounds tracked as opposed to MIDI, which is part of the reason why the music quality rises above other shareware and even commercial titles coming out at the time. As for its current release state, 3D Realms made the game freeware quite a number of years ago, and thus can be obtained for free from the 3D Realms website at www.3drealms.com. Since the game was sold as shareware, physical copies of both shareware and full versions are out there to be found, and while they're not super rare, they're not easy to find either, and the prices can range dramatically, with the cheapest copies I've found being around $8, and the most expensive being over $50. Since the game's free now though, the only reason to go for a physical copy is for sake of collecting. The story for this game is very simple, so I'm only going to briefly touch on it. Basically, aliens warp in from somewhere in the universe and attach their spaceship to the top of a skyscraper belonging to Big Corp, which we can assume is a massive corporation which handles all kinds of things in the future. The aliens have their sights set on world domination, and to achieve this goal, they start turning innocent people into mindless zombies, not to mention unleashing some of their own monsters as well. Only trouble is that all full-fledged assaults on the aliens have failed, so a more discreet approach is called for. Enter our protagonist, Harry, who's been tasked to save all the civilians and destroy the aliens, going from the outside through the sewers, up through the factory, then the Big Corp skyscraper, and ultimately right into the alien mothership parked on top. The gameplay itself is fairly straightforward. You move around with the arrow keys, but you don't have a jump button. Instead, you have a jetpack. You have a button to fire your selected weapon, a button to cycle your weapons, and you also have a button to flick a radar on and off which can be used to gauge where the civilians are who need rescuing. Your main method of attack is a flamethrower, which was actually a somewhat ingenious choice for the main weapon of a jetpack using character. 
It fires extremely rapidly, but has a short range of attack. Thus, all the other weapons you can acquire go one step further in terms of overall capability. The flamethrower and jetpack also share the same fuel source, and while the flamethrower won't fire if you run out of ammo, the jetpack will still work to some degree, but we'll touch on that later. The other weapons you can get include the photon gun, missiles, thermo grenades, micro nukes, and the all-powerful Omega. The photon gun is similar to the flamethrower, but much more powerful and long-ranged. The missiles instantly home in on nearby enemies and can take them out in a single shot, though you don't have a choice over which enemy is tracked. The thermal grenades are also a one-hit kill, but are thrown like grenades and either explode on contact with an enemy or after a few seconds. The micro nukes destroy everything in range, but they take a moment to explode, while the Omega works just like the micro nukes, but instantly, thus meaning you don't have to plan as far ahead to use them. You acquire weapons from vending machines found throughout each level, but most of these cost money, which you acquire by defeating enemies. The only ones which are free are the ones which restore your fuel levels for your jetpack and flamethrower. You also find food scattered out and about to restore chunks of health, or rescuing a civilian will instantly restore all of your health. There's also one-ups hidden extremely well, usually in dead ends, and require you to shoot at nothing in order to reveal them. And since we're done talking about how to actually play the game now, this is the perfect lead-in for the next topic at hand. Okay guys, I have to level with you. I barely got anywhere in this game. I completed episode 1, couldn't beat the first level of episode 2, and couldn't beat the second level of episode 3. Well, as for episode 4, it's only accessible if you beat the other three episodes, so I don't even know what it contains or looks like. But the reason I barely got anywhere in this game is because it has so many issues. The first issue we'll address is the level design. Not all, but most of the levels are not only mazes, but mazes you can't solve unless you find not only secret rooms, but hidden things which aren't located in secret rooms at all. It's not uncommon for civilians you need to rescue being hidden behind foreground objects, making them virtually impossible to spot with your eyes, or to be tucked away in secret rooms which aren't easy to get into because there's no visible way to do so. Granted, many of the secrets do have differences in the walls so that you can spot them, but not all of them. The next issue is the physics. Harry skips around and gets pushed into and out of walls like crazy, making it feel like you really don't have a lot of control over the character, even though the controls are fairly responsive. This is made worse by the horrible jetpack physics. When you activate your jetpack, your horizontal momentum is cancelled, and you need to build up horizontal momentum all over again at a much slower rate in order to get moving. This makes the jetpack feel very unnatural to use. Worse still, when you cut your jetpack thrust, you again lose your horizontal momentum. I can forgive it for doing this on takeoff, but when you're in mid-air, there's no excuse for instantly losing your momentum from cutting your thrust. Basically, the game's jetpack physics suck. The collision detection isn't very forgiving either, made worse by the collision box for level collisions being substantially different depending on if you're in mid-air or walking. This creates situations where you can never be sure if a wall you're butting into is a secret wall or not without testing it more than once since falling into walls is natural and can happen without it actually being a secret wall. In terms of shooting your weapons, the hit detection is seemingly pixel accurate, which is okay for the most part, but because of how Harry can skip several pixels at a time, you can't rely on the pixel accuracy to work in your favor. Another poor design decision was the flamethrower and jetpack intermixing, but not for the reasons you might expect. Making the jetpack and flamethrower tied to the same fuel source makes sense, the trouble is with this being your primary means of both attack and movement. If you run out of fuel, you not only become unable to attack without secondary weapons, but if you try to use your jetpack, it will cut out at random, often making it take much longer to get anywhere if it's even possible. Fuel dispensers are fairly common, but sometimes there can be a lot of level between two of them, making it very difficult to get back to one, especially when you don't have a secondary means of vertical ascent like jumping. Also, when you don't have your flamethrower selected, you have no idea how much fuel you have left for jetpacking. Speaking of, the weapon power indicators work well enough for the micro nukes and Omega, but for all other weapons, it doesn't clearly indicate how many shots you have left, as each tick on the power meter actually counts for several shots. 
On the topic of the status bar, the manual alludes to there being a timer which would have been used for bonus points if you could beat a level quickly, but this was changed at some point to a captive's counter, since the goal of each level was changed so that you had to rescue all the civilians before you could move on. Now, there's another oddity like this, but to a much more extreme degree. In the manual, Mission 1 is indicated as a skyscraper, and Mission 3 is indicated as the sewers. Yet when you actually play the game, Mission 1 is the sewers, and Mission 3 is the skyscraper. Mission 1 also happens to show Mission 3 as the boss image during the briefing, while Mission 3 shows Mission 1 on the boss image. The levels are clearly sewer based for Mission 1 and building based for Mission 3, so I can only imagine a last minute decision was made at some point to swap the two level sets. Which, given the fact that the skyscraper missions actually provide tutorial type messages to help you learn how to play the game, it makes it extremely weird and out of place to finally get those messages in Mission 3 long after you've figured these details out the hard way by dying and getting stuck a lot, and ultimately reading the manual because there was no help in Mission 1. There's a number of bugs too. For instance, in this particular sewer level, you're supposed to be able to jetpack into this area to save that civilian. But collision boxes must have been changed at some point or something because there's no way whatsoever to access that area. I just got really lucky with the collision detection and managed to have just a single pixel of my character touch a single pixel of a civilian without actually getting up there. Another bug is the switches. You activate switches in this game simply by pressing the fire button while over top of them. Sounds fair enough. Except the instant the switch is toggled, you're able to fire your weapons again, meaning it's very easy to lose shots of your expensive special weapons just from trying to toggle a switch. So every time you intend to flip a switch, you have to make sure to have your flamethrower selected, or be extremely quick with the fire button so as not to hold it long enough to trigger an attack. And one thing that which technically isn't a bug, but kind of acts like one, has to do with keeping your weapons at the end of missions. See, when you reach a boss, the designers must have thought that it would have been too easy to use your special weapons against them. So instead of making those weapons simply do alternate damage to the bosses, they just remove them entirely from your inventory and give you an unlimited amount of flamethrower fuel. Fair enough, I guess, except you don't get your weapons back when you beat the boss and move on to the next mission. So anything you spent money on up to a boss is lost when you finally face the boss. Furthermore, the bosses themselves have a ridiculous number of hit points, so taking away all of the player's weapons and forcing them to use the flamethrower feels like the designers are just trying to solve a problem which doesn't even exist. Instead, they should have just let the player either waste all of their special weapons on the boss, thus entering the next level with nothing anyways, or let players decide to save their special weapons and focus on using their flamethrower so they could move on with their special weapons intact. Respawning enemies are also bugged a little. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but it has something to do with the screen position and the other enemies you've defeated. Basically, when you kill an enemy, you can mostly rely on it staying gone, unless you kill more enemies, at which point it could come back in an instant if its spawn location is not on screen. A handful of enemy types stay dead once defeated though, so it's sort of a matter of learning which work that way, which don't, and being mindful that just because you killed something doesn't mean it won't be back just moments later when you end up reaching a dead end and have to go back the way you came. Even scrolling the screen up or down intentionally can cause enemies to respawn right where you are, immediately getting you hurt in the process. The worst bug of all though is the one I showed you guys right at the start of this video. Basically, I would play a level for a bit, get killed somehow, and instead of losing a life and going back to the last checkpoint I reached, the game executable would throw a runtime error 203 and restart the level in the same state I entered it in. In one sense, this meant getting free lives, but it also meant going through entire levels all over again, and since a single level can take over 7 minutes to beat once you know what you're doing, dying near the end and replaying entire levels got old fast. Now, there were some issues originally with this game in DOSBox leading to Runtime Error 200 being thrown. But 203 is a heap overflow, a memory issue. I tried fiddling with DOSBox's memory settings, but to no avail. So whether this is an emulation issue or a problem the game has on real systems, I have no idea and it made it virtually impossible to make any decent progress in this thing. Also, dying to something tiny I didn't notice because it wasn't making pain sounds when I touched it is just a dick move, plain and simple. Alien Carnage looks good and has okay music, but plays like an unfinished broken mess. 
I don't even go into the more minor details, like the absence of sounds where you'd expect there to be sounds, the very unusual fading out before fading in effects, the undefeatable enemy types which get in your way and cause huge amounts of damage, the design of the first level of Mission 2 basically forcing you to do the entire thing without any health restoration, the flying enemies which are virtually impossible to dodge or hit with your weapons, the retractable spikes which allow you to sometimes walk through them while they're up but sometimes don't, and I know I missed even more than that. Even as a free download, it's hard to recommend this thing to anyone because I got zero enjoyment out of it and because it's just loaded with issues. However, I feel I should point out that this is not the only game in the series. There was a later sequel called Zombie Wars, which... Actually, from what I understand, has similar issues to this game, but not as many of those issues. The drawback there is that Zombie Wars never got a freeware release as far as I can tell, so it doesn't really make it for a good alternative. If you want to run this thing in DOSBox, you need to set cycles to max, and you also need to turn off timed intervals if you intend to use a joystick or gamepad. I tried various memory settings to fix the runtime errors, but nothing worked, so if anyone has any info about that, let me know and I'll post the details in the additional information section below the video on my website. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Episode 174 will be on Saturday, October 3rd, and we'll be taking a look at an anti-war game which itself stirred up a massive amount of controversy. Guess the subtlety of the game was lost on a large segment of the world's population. If you think you know which game that could be, then be sure to send your guests as soon as you can to adg at pixelships.com, and stay tuned because if the past week was any indication, a lot more people are sending in guesses now than ever before.